Let's get this shit started. This is the Down and Dirty Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast with your host, Nick Anderson. What is up, Dynasty Degenerates? This is your host, Nick Anderson, with the Down and Dirty Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast, or as you all know it, the Triple D F F P. And guys, I'm so happy to be here with you today. I've got, and I don't want you to look directly at it because it's so goddamn beautiful that you might burn your eyes out, but I've got my new microphone with me today, and I could not be happier. I hope that you guys are hearing me crystal clear right now, and I'm just so excited to have the new computer, the new mic, everything just set up and ready to go for you in today's episode. I'm super excited about it because what we're going to be going over is a, is a new segment that I like to call Same But Different, okay? So what we're going to be talking about today is ADPs that are similar amongst players, but players that are completely different at those ADPs, okay? So I'm going to be giving you two sets from the running backs, two sets from the wide receivers, and two sets from the tight ends. And, you know, without further ado, let's just jump right into it, guys. So, you know, our first set of running backs is going to be J.K. Dobbins, Ronald Jones, and Devin Singletary. So, J.K. Dobbins comes in at an FFPC ADP of 63. Ronald Jones comes in at 60. And Devin Singletary comes in at 53. Okay? So, when we're looking at those guys, we got to analyze what's going on with each of them. And I'm going to let you make your own decisions right now on which one is the same but different. But we know. So let's start up at the top with J.K. Dobbins. He is an absolutely explosive rookie coming into this season, you guys. And yes, he does find himself in a disadvantageous situation coming in behind an experienced veteran like Mark Ingram. But Mark Ingram is not going to be there after this year. I'm telling you right now, it's written in stone. J.K. Dobbins is going to be the bell cow back in Baltimore come 2021. We look at his stats here from Ohio State. He had he played in 14 games with 301 or 301 carries for 2,003 yards and 23 total touchdowns with 247 receiving yards involved in there as well with 7.6 percent uh, target share. Guys, this he is not just a running back; he is a receiving back as well. He does it all super well. His agility, his hands, everything are great. But let's move on to the other guy that we got in here, Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones at ADP 60, okay? So you got to take him a little bit earlier than JK coming in. But Ronald Jones, he has some competition too in one of my guys. You know he's my dude in Keyshawn Vaughn in Tampa, okay? So, and also we got LaShawn McCoy out there now too. But, so he's got to compete with Keyshawn Vaughn, but Ronald Jones is the younger, you know, more established NFL running back. Even though he hasn't popped on the scene like we wanted him to after his draft, he still had a productive season last year. And if you go watch the tape, you saw him get better and better as the year went on. And, I mean, it's it's no fluke. He was starting to perform. They got rid of Peyton Barber. So now we're looking at a Ronald Jones, Keyshawn Vaughn split there, you know. And I'm not mad at it. I think that Ronald Jones is going to be able to produce a lot better than everybody else thinks that he is. So, I mean, you know, we're looking at a 60 ADP right there. Then we go on to the third guy in this in this uh, this matchup, and it's going to be Devin Singletary out in Buffalo, okay? He's got an incoming freshman and Zach Moss nipping at his heels. And if you, if you look around the Twitterverse, Zach Moss is a very polarizing player right now, okay? But what he does do well is he was number one in force missed tackles in the NCAA. The guy is an absolute workhorse, a truck stick machine, and he does it well. Now, Devin Singletary is a little bit of a different back, but neither of them are particularly tried and true receiving backs. Moss might actually have the edge on that. And so Singletary at five foot seven and 203 pounds might not have the juice to be able to hold off, you know, this juggernaut of a rusher in Zach Moss. So when we're looking at the ADPs here, We've got Devin Singletary at ADP 53. We've got Ronald Jones at ADP 60. And we've got J.K. Dobbins at ADP 63. All right around there within a round of each other. Guys, this is an absolute fucking landslide for J.K. Dobbins. If you find yourself in this situation, do not hesitate between these three ever in the history of anything. You smash J.K. Dobbins' name every single time. The people that we talked about with Ronald Jones and Devin Singletary – their competition are incoming rookies. They're there for the next four years, and they're also skilled dudes at that. 
But we got J.K. Dobbins, who is an all-star, top three talent in his class, which is a stout class at that, okay? Top three talent in his class, you guys, coming in behind an aged Mark Ingram who's going to be gone next season with an explosive, high-octane Ravens offense that is going to be getting him into scoring opportunities. You know, we can see a lot of the same production that Mark Ingram saw there. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're looking at these three options, do not hesitate. Take J.K. Dobbins because they might have the same ADP, but that motherfucker's different, all right? So let's move on to our next grouping of running backs that we've got here. And it's going to be Justin Jackson at ADP 168, Jamal Williams at ADP 229, and Jarek McKinnon at ADP 221, okay? So I understand that Jackson is a little bit ahead of these guys at 168 compared to 40 spots lower, you know, or actually more than 40 spots, 60 spots lower at 221 and 229. But they're in the same situation there. You look at Jarek McKinnon's backfield, and he's got, you know, a handful of guys in front of him, Coleman, Mostert, those guys, okay? You look at Williams' backfield, where he was the beta in that backfield. Now he has to compete with A.J. Dillon, also Aaron Jones, who's still there and killing it. Then we look at Justin Jackson. With the addition of Josh Kelly, that backfield has gotten a lot more cluttered with Austin Eckler being the number one there, okay? So we're looking at three backs that are slated in right now as the tertiary backs, in my opinion, in their offense. Jackson, I know we could debate that a little bit, but he falls below Josh Kelly, in my opinion. Josh Kelly is nothing to slap, nothing to laugh at. He he has all of the same things that I saw Sony Michelle coming in, and I mean that in the best way possible. Okay, but so we're looking at the tertiary backs and their offenses. You know, Justin Jackson's up at one sixty eight. We got Jamal Williams at two twenty nine, and Jarek McKinnon at two twenty one. So we've got to sit here and analyze what are we going to do with this. You know. So let's talk about Justin Jackson. He's got Austin Eckler in front of him who got paid. He got the money. And also he's got the fucking just uh, yoked up, guys. If you didn't see that video of this dude doing his bow flex in his backyard, he looks like a freaking car, uh, uh, video game character with how yoked up he is. Austin Eckler is a tried and true receiving back. You know, he's not going to be that guy that bangs it in between the tackles 20 times a, 20 times a game. And that's where the value lies in this Chargers backfield, you know? So that's why it's interesting. That's why Justin Jackson's probably up there at that 168. But then we've got the incoming rookie in Josh Kelly. And I'm telling you, Josh Kelly is a banger in and of himself. And I don't see them letting Justin Jackson run wild. If anything, he's going to be splitting the between the tackles work with Josh Kelly. And that's just something that's not super alluring to me. So you're splitting the second back work in half. I understand that he might be getting the production. That There's a good chance that Justin Jackson is going to get the production over the three of these guys season long. But when we're down at ADP 168, down at ADP 221 and ADP 229, what I'm interested in is the home run hitters at this point. I'm not interested in the guy that's guaranteed to get two to three carries a game and is going to put up 3.5 points on a fantasy spreadsheet every game. You know, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is the guy that has the ability to take the job and run away with it. Okay, so let's move on to Jamal Williams. Now, we've seen Jamal Williams in this backfield. We saw him get drafted above Aaron Jones. You know, we saw them have high hopes for Jamal Williams, and he just never came through for you. And now we've got a guy in the backfield by the name of A.J. Dillon. And if you know anything about my show, if you know anything about my Twitter, you know that I do not like A.J. Dillon. I don't think he's ever going to be a top 20 running back in the NFL. I don't think that he has the juice to produce. But what he does have is a 250-pound frame that can just bang it up the middle, even if he does go down easy on first contact. But the Packers drafted him to be a Derrick Henry 2.0. He's never going to live up to that but they're going to give him the work to be able to try and live up to that. You don't pay the draft capital that you did for him to not utilize him. So Jamal Williams finds himself as the odd man out in this offense. Aaron Jones is killing it up front with the receiving work and, you know, the, the elusiveness that he has. A.J. Dillon's going to be crushing it with the targets that he's going to be getting in the red zone and the, you know, the touchdown efficiency that he might be seeing. And Jamal Williams is left out in the cold, needing a coat, you know, just shivering, teeth shattering. So I don't think that there's anything there for Jamal Williams unless there's an injury that happens. So then we'll look at Jer Jarek McKinnon, you know, out in San Francisco. 
and McKinnon restructured his deal for one year. He's been injured his entire time in San Francisco, and we have seen some good things out of Jarek McKinnon in the past. You know, I mean, he has impressed, and that's why everybody was so excited about him when he went to San Francisco. I'm going to look this up real quick. Hold on. But Jarek McKinnon's stat line in the past and in the, in the time that he got the chance when he was playing for Minnesota is just great. I mean, he impressed to the max. And the yards, the yards per attempt aren't that great, but it's the passing work where he excels. He had 150 carries for 570 yards and three touchdowns in 2017, and he had a 3.8 yards per attempt, so that's not fantastic. But what he did have that he just excelled at was he had 68 targets for 51 receiving or for 51 receptions, 421 yards in receiving, and two touchdowns, okay? He had a 75% catch rate. He also had an 81.1% catch rate in 2016, and he has a 74.3% catch rate over the course of his career. This guy has hands like you guys wouldn't believe, and that is going to be vital to the backfield of this San Francisco offense, and he's going to come back in. He's going to come back in healthy, and there are, I mean, Raheem Mostert, great. You know, he's cool. I'm sure that they're going to use him. Jerry, or uh, um, I'm sorry, Tevin Coleman, he's great too. Whatever, that's fine. But neither of these guys ran away with the job last year. We saw Breida get work. We saw uh, uh, Tevin Coleman get work. We saw Raheem Moster get work. And Raheem Moster, man, that guy, even though he came back healthy every single week, he is dinged and banged up, and he is injury-prone as they come. And so I'm not saying Jarek McKinnon isn't, but when we're looking at these guys, like I was telling you, Justin Jackson at ADP 168, Jamal Williams at ADP 229, and Jarek McKinnon at ADP 221. If there was one guy that I had to pick out of this list that could just run away with the job because they haven't seen the field yet, we don't know exactly what they're capable of, it's going to be Jarek McKinnon. So he's going to be my pick. Justin Jackson doesn't impress me much out there. Shania Twain, shout out. Jamal Williams, you know, not getting it. AJ or AJ Dillon in front of him, Aaron Jones in front of him. That's not what I'm looking for right there. Jarek McKinnon is the guy who we haven't gotten to see out there. He's the guy that the coaches, you know, restructured a deal for because they want to see him on the field. He's the guy that hasn't gotten the chance, but produced before he came there, came over specifically to be their guy. Jarek McKinnon's the guy that you want to go with on this. And at ADP 221 amongst these three, he is hands down. The one that is similar in ADP, but just built different, y'all. So those are our running backs, okay? So I'll go back through the list of the running backs. We had J.K. Dobbins, Ronald Jones, and Devin Singletary. Of those three, J.K. Dobbins at the lowest ADP, because that makes sense. At 63, is hands down the different player amongst these three. And he's the one that you need to be going with if you ever find yourself in such a dumb problem right there. The next three is going to be Justin Jackson, Jamal Williams, and Jarek McKinnon. We got the three J's in the house, okay? And Jarek McKinnon is sitting right there at that middle ADP of 221. He's the one that you want in this because he's that home run hitter. We're not looking for consistency down in the 200 ADPs. We're looking for somebody who can run away with it, and Jarek McKinnon is the one that can run away with it if given the opportunity. So those are our running backs. Now we go to the now we got to go to the pass catchers. But first, I got to take a drink break. We're drinking Guinness tonight, you guys. We're a really heavy, thick Guinness, all right? No bush light tonight. I know I'm doing my boys dirty, but I felt like something different. All right, so let's get on to the wide receivers. So when our first similar but different grouping, we've got John Brown, Mike Williams, and Anthony Miller, okay? And amongst those three, we're looking at John Brown at ADP 146, Mike Williams at ADP 151, and Anthony Miller at ADP 156, okay? All of those guys find themselves with alpha number ones in front of them. John Brown now finds himself in an offense where one of the best route runners in the NFL, Stephon Diggs, is in front of him. Mike Williams finds himself in a Chargers offense where Keenan Allen, one of the best route runners in the NFL, is in front of him. Anthony Miller finds himself in a Chicago Bears offense with one of the best wide receivers in the NFL in front of him and Allen Robinson, okay? So we're looking at these beta wolves out here in these teams, and we're having to decide through them. John Brown at 156, Mike Williams at 151, Anthony Miller at 156. You're, you're within like a round and a half of each other right there, so you might have to make this question 
when you're looking for your, you know, wide receiver four, your flex wide receiver, something like that on your offense, who are you going to go with? Well, let's start with John Brown. John Brown had a very impressive season last year with a very inaccurate Josh Allen throwing him the ball. He had a 94.9% snap share, um, 91.1% route participation. He had 28 deep targets, which was number five in the league. He had a 25.7% target share, which was 10th in the league. He had 72 receptions for 1,060 receiving yards. Um, Total touchdowns, he has six touchdowns, and he had 14.7 fantasy points per game, okay? So, John Brown, honestly, I mean, for all of us who were Smoke Brown advocates, who were ringing that dinner bell just saying he just needs the opportunity, you know, and then he goes to Buffalo and he performs. We were all vindicated on that. I love John Brown. Don't get me wrong. I love John Brown. But that was all done. Everything that he did right there was done without Stephon Diggs in town. And I'm telling you, Diggs is just a different beast. Okay, and I think him and Josh Allen are going to build a real rapport. It also doesn't hurt when we're looking at this to realize that John Brown is 30.4 years old. Okay, he's getting up there in age. He is not a young buck anymore. And I know speed's the last thing to go. We look at guys like Deshaun Jackson. Speed's the last thing to go on him. But John Brown's game is predicated off of speed. He's predicated on that deep ball. And Stephon Diggs likes those deep balls as well. And he excels in those deep balls. So John Brown's going to find himself in a very, very competitive situation coming into 2020 with a quarterback who we don't know if he has the ability to be able to float two high-end wide receivers like that. So then we look at Mike Williams, kind of the opposite of a John Brown. You know, he's 6'4", 218 pounds, but he was picked 107 in the draft, you know. I mean, Mike Williams, we all had high hopes for Mike Williams. And last year, he saw an 87.5% snap share. He had an 83.6% route participation. He had 90 targets, 27 deep targets, which was number eight in the league. He had 16.5% target share, which was number 63rd in the league. He had 49 receptions for 1,001. Yes, he broke the 1,000 mark, too. People don't always realize that, you know. He had two total touchdowns, and he had 10.8 fantasy points per game. Now, I'm going to look right here. I want to see how many red zone targets he got, if I can find that. Because the thing that's crazy about him is that he had over 1,000 yards. He's six foot four, 218 pounds, and somehow he only came down with two touchdowns in the end zone. That is just absolutely insane to me. I do not understand how that is a thing, and I'm not going to be able to find his red zone targets in here. Um, he had three red zone receptions, but you know, I think that there is honestly a positive regression in touchdowns in Mike Williams future. I think that he showed us that he has the juice to produce in 2019 with that over one that when he eclipsed 1000 yards in the season, oh. you know, he showed that he has the juice to produce by eclipsing a thousand yards. And I think that he's going to have some touchdown regression, you know, to the mean positive regression in 2020 now we are going to have to see a world where tyrod taylor's thrown in the ball and that makes all the difference from philip rivers of last year but you guys philip rivers wasn't philip rivers last year if you were watching the games he was an absolute liability out there in certain games so i'm not saying that tyrod's going to be an improvement but i'm also not saying that he's going to be too much worse and with justin herbert waiting in the wings learning developing and eventually coming in to usurp usurp tyrod taylor I think that they have the opportunity to be able to build a real rapport here. And this is where Mike Williams could make some serious ground because Keenan Allen already had the bromance with Phillip Rivers. He already had that solidified, entrenched, you know, relationship with him. Mike Williams is playing on a bat or, you know, on an even playing field with Keenan Allen now. So his skills can shine through as opposed to just the relationship. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that he is better than Keenan Allen. But I am saying that Mike Williams is better than what he's shown us so far. And now the third one on the list is Anthony Miller. Okay. Anthony Miller is five foot 11, 201 pounds. You know, we expected a lot out of this guy, and he just hasn't exactly been able to show it. He had a 61.2% catch rate last year, and I think his catch rate was even worse in 2018. So those are things that worry us with him. He had 52 receptions for 656 yards and uh, two total touchdowns last season. He had a 66.5% snap share. 
He had, you know, 85 targets, 17 deep targets, and a 15% target share. And Anthony Miller's problem is he hasn't been able to stay on the field, you know. And with the quarterback situation being what it is there, we got Mitch Trubisky, we got Big Dick Nick waiting in the wings. You don't know who's going to be the starter. And everything is just kind of in flux there. And I just don't think that Anthony Miller has the ability to, you know, jump drastically from what he did last year. I think we might see a couple more touchdowns, maybe 100 more yards. But I don't think when we're looking at these guys, so let's go back over who we who we talked about on this, you know. I don't think when we're looking at John Brown at 146, Anthony Miller at 156, I don't think these guys have the ability to drastically outkick their coverage on this. John Brown might be able to do something, but I don't think they're going to be able to do what we want them to do. Mike Williams, on the other hand, Mike Williams, on the other hand, a young man, you know, who has fought some injuries too, but a big body set up for some positive touchdown regression a thousand yards last year a thousand yards last year with tyrod taylor coming in and justin herbert waiting in the wings and i'm much higher i'm much more bullish on justin herbert than a lot of the other fantasy analysts in the community are i think that this that the future is very very bright for a guy named mike williams so when you're looking at these players john brown mike williams anthony miller 146 151 and 156 you got to go with mike williams every single time no questions asked. This one's not even close for me, you guys, because Mike Williams has the size. He's got the youth. He's got the production. He's got the ability to be able to build the rapport with Justin Herbert when he comes in. I'm just telling you, Mike Williams might be the same ADP as these guys, but he is different. Thank you for saying it with me. So let's move on to our next grouping. If you guys know me, if you know the show, if you know the Twitter, you're going to know the answer to this one before we even get in. But we got three guys coming up right now. We've got Denzel Mims coming in at ADP 223, Hunter Renfro coming in at ADP 226, and Larry Fitzgerald coming in at ADP 224. Damn, that is close. We are talking within three spots in ADP on this one, fellas. So you are going to have to be making this decision, judging by the FFPC ADP. All right, with the triple D F F P. So this is answers we got to know right now. Okay. So let's start at the bottom. Let's look at Larry Fitzgerald at ADP 224. Okay. So Larry Fitzgerald last year, and, and it's Larry Fitzgerald, man. We know how great he is. We know how great he's been. We know what he's done in the arena of fantasy sports. He's one of the goats. Okay. Everybody's got good feelings about him because he won you a championship one time down the road. So in 2019, he had an 84.2% snap share. He had 79.2% route participation, 109 targets. Then we look at deep targets. He had 15 deep targets and a 20.6% uh, target share. He had 75 receptions for 804 receiving yards and four touchdowns. But that is all going to change come 2020, guys, because there's a new sheriff in town. Like we said, Larry Fitzgerald is one of the GOATs. But one of the young goats, you know, just just coming up to eat Larry Fitzgerald's grass is a guy by the name of DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins comes to town and is going to be a target monster in Arizona. And also Christian Kirk out there is making his way up through the ranks. He is he is eating away, just eating away. At Larry Fitzgerald's slot snaps, okay? And that's something that Christian Kirk is going to continue to do because we've seen him continue to grow as a wide receiver out in Arizona. And Larry Fitzgerald, man, is about to be a change into the guard. You know, he's 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 past his prime. He has been past his prime. He's still producing, you know, against all odds, against God, against nature, against father time. He's 37 years old, but this is the year where it all catches up with him. This is the year where DeAndre Hopkins comes in and takes the crown away from him. Christian Kirk takes the slot snaps away from him. You know, Kyler Murray does increase, but he can't increase to be able to save a 37-year-old Larry Fitzgerald. So Larry Fitzgerald comes in at ADP 224. Then we look at Hunter Renfro, okay? And if you follow Fantasy Twitter, you know that there has been a lot of buzz around Hunter Renfro getting excited about this kid, okay? And I personally think that he looks like my mom's accountant from H&R Block. So I don't trust that when I look at him and I see her accountant and they look the same. It doesn't scream fantasy football production to me, but I have seen a lot of people that I respect tout this guy. OK, so let's talk about him a little bit. 
Hunter Renfro is five foot ten, 184 pounds, which is drastically lighter than I would like any of my wide receivers to be. But he had a 54.2% snap share last season, 59.8% route participation, 71 targets. He had seven deep targets and a 17.6% target share. He had 49 receptions last year for 605 receiving yards and four touchdowns. Okay. 10.3% or 10.3 points for uh, fantasy points per game. But just like we were talking about with Larry Fitzgerald, it's not age that's going to catch Hunter Renfro. It's competition, man. Oh, the Raiders are trying to mimic the Kansas City Chiefs, my Kansas City Chiefs. And it is a foolhardy endeavor because they're missing the special sauce. The Patrick Mahomes. They're missing the special sauce, guys. Derek Carr ain't Patrick Mahomes, but they're trying to organize their offense in the way that we are. So they got Henry Ruggs, who they think is going to be Tyreek Hill. Spoiler alert, he's not. And then they've got Brian Edwards out there. They're trying to get that big-bodied guy. They're trying to get Brian Edwards and Darren Waller to be the Travis Kelsey role that we've got in Kansas City. And you know what? I'm high on Brian Edwards. I'm low on Darren Waller. But all of these names that we're hearing, Lynn Bowden, Josh Jacobs is supposed to get more receptions. All of this stuff is telling me that the target share that Hunter Renfro got last season is not going to be there. There's too many mouths to feed, okay? It's just not – you're not capable of doing it. I mean, if you're passing 750 times a season, then, yeah, sure, you can get everybody the ball. But if you're not doing that, their targets are going to be hard to come by. And if you can't get targets, you can't get yards. And if you can't get yards, then you can't get touchdowns. If you can't get touchdowns, you can't get fantasy football points. You guys seeing where I'm going with this? If you can't get any of that, you're not going to be living up to your ADP. So then let's go on to the next guy. And like I said, it was an easy one. It was an obvious one. It was a gimme one from the start because you guys know how much I love my boy, Denzel Mims. And so he comes in at ADP 223. Six foot three, 207 pounds, picked 2.27 in the draft, going to the Jets from a guy who I am higher on than the rest of the league or than the rest of the fantasy analysts and Sam Darnold, a 23 year old quarterback, younger than Joe Burrow, who's still learning the ropes, had mono last season. So he's going to come back just better than ever. He's got all the antibodies. I don't think you can get mono again. So that's great for him. But you know, Denzel Mims is just one of these rare, freakish athletes. You know, he doesn't have the most diver, diverse route tree. He doesn't run the crisp, the crispest routes, crispest routes. But what he does do is he has the innate ability to be able to get people turned around. He's got body control. He understands the mechanics of other people's bodies. He's got sticky hands, even though he has had a little bit of a drop problem, but his drops are concentration drops. His drops aren't a product, a, pro a product of him not having good hands. It's a product of him taking his eyes away and letting it bounce off his fucking chest. You know, Denzel Mims, his last year at Baylor, had 66 receptions for 1,020 receiving yards. He had a 24.1% target share and a 61% catch rate and had 12 touchdowns, okay? That might not sound great, but he was an instrumental part in the Baylor offense. And if you go watch his tape, every fucking reception is a highlight reel, guys. And then you add all of that to his combine performance. He ran a 4.3840, six foot three, is 115.6 uh, speed score, 131 burst score, 11.9 agility score, and he's got a 10.34 catch radius. I'm telling you guys, his collegiate production and his combine metrics. I'm not saying he's going to be this guy, but I'm saying. That And you heard it here first. If there was a guy that had it in his range of outcomes, now I'm not saying, I'm saying that it is in his range of outcomes to be as good as a guy named Julio Jones. Denzel Mims is the guy. I'm saying, go look up Julio Jones' draft profile. Raw had a problem with concentration drops. Hyper athletic. Big as shit. Okay. Aggressive. Strong. You know, dedicated, gritty. These are all words. All the problems, all the pros that Denzel Mims has are the same shit that Julio Jones had, okay? And I'm telling you, go watch Denzel Mims block. Go watch the kid block. And you tell me that he doesn't have the determination to turn himself into one of the best wide receivers in this league. A guy who blocks like that cares about his craft. He's determined. 
He's gritty. I'm telling you guys, don't be sleeping on Denzel Mims. I understand he's going to an Adam Gase offense. I get it. I understand that he's going to Sam Darnold, who hasn't had the best career. But y'all, he's 23 years old. And if they flame out again, guess what? They're probably getting Trevor fucking Lawrence. So you tell me if you want Denzel Mims having the ball thrown to him by Trevor Lawrence. Because I'd say yeah. So either way you cut it, this kid is on the a freaking rocket ship to the moon. And when you're looking at the ADPs between these guys, you know, Larry Fitzgerald at 224 at 37 years old. Hunter Renfro at ADP 226 with every mouth in the village to feed. He's got a soup kitchen around him that everybody needs fed, okay? Hunter, Ren Hunter Renfro is going to be the one that's starving, left out in the cold, you know, just like we were talking about with Justin Jackson, you know? So then we're looking at – then we're or, or Jamal Williams, I'm sorry. Then we're looking at Denzel Mims at ADP 223. You know, he's sitting right there, nestled. You know, just above those two. And De Denzel Mims, you guys, is an absolute superstar in the making. Do not sleep on him. Get him in your rookie drafts. Get him in your startups that don't do rookie drafts. Trade for him. Be happy about it. Get your football cards for him. Get your cheap rookie cards for him right now. Because I'm telling you right now, book it. Triple DFFP told you the kid's going to be a superstar. All right? So get ready for it. Now, let's go back over our wide receivers. Let's do a recap of what we got there. So, in our first grouping, we've got John Brown at ADP 146, Mike Williams at 151, and Anthony Miller at 156. And the guy that is similar in ADP, but just built different is Mike Williams at ADP 151, okay? I think that he's got the ability to be able to build that rapport with Herbert down the line. I think he's got the ability for touchdown regression in the positive you know, everything is signs, you know, all gas, no breaks for Mike Williams. Then we'll look down at our next grouping. We've got Denzel Mims at ADP 223, Hunter Renfro at ADP 226, and Larry Fitzgerald at ADP 224. And you guys, it's easy. It's easy. It's a slam dunk. It's Denzel Mims every single time, 17 times on Sunday. All right. So Denzel Mims is going to Get the ball thrown to him by Sam Darnold. The guy's got just an ad is an insane athlete with insane body control, with insane upside, who's gonna produce insanely in the NFL. So get ready for it. Now let's move on to our tight ends. Okay. So we're gonna do the similar but different tight ends now. So let's look at it. The first grouping that we've got is Jacob Hollister at ADP 334, Jeremy Sprinkle at ADP 336. And Adam Troutman at ADP 343, okay? So we're all looking right about within a round of each other on these guys. So they are all they all find themselves in, the, in not such adv advantageous situations. So let's look at uh, Jeremy Sprinkle. You know, let's start with Jeremy Sprinkle. Sprinkle man. So where's he at on here? So he finds himself as a starting tight end in Washington, which we know has just been uber prosperous in the past. Oh, it hasn't. Okay, but he is six foot five, two hundred and fifty two pounds. You know, he's twenty six years old. He's twenty six years old. He's twenty six years old, and I don't think that I could tell you a stat or a play that he's ever made. I am not excited about this guy. But let's look at what he did last year. He had twenty six receptions for two hundred and forty one receiving yards and one touchdown. Okay. Jeremy Sprinkle is going to find himself in a weird situation in Washington. He's got a quarterback throw on the ball that I, I am a supporter of. I like Dwayne Haskins. But, you know, there's going to be – it's going to be weird. You know, we've got Antonio Gibson catching the ball out of the backfield. So he's going to be wanting targets. We've got, you know, we've got F1, Terry McLaurin, who demands targets. And I think his target share is just going to go up. We've got AGG coming in. You know, we've got Steve Sims in there. So you can be a lot of mouths to feed there as well. Even though this doesn't sound like one of the best wide receiver cores in the NFL, I think that they're going to really impress people. I'm super excited about uh, AGG, you know, uh, Gandy Golden. I'm super excited about Steve Sims. And obviously everybody's excited about Terry McLaurin. So that means that I am not excited about Jerry Sprinkle, who has a weird name. Okay. But let's go on to Jacob Hollister. He finds himself in Seattle. And, you know, he is six foot three, 239 pounds. And his stat line that he has, 41 receptions last year, 349 receiving yards, and three touchdowns. But let me look real quick at the Seattle Seahawks depth chart. Because I would like to see who they list as their starting tight end. 
because I'm not sure if it is the guy that we are talking about right now. And it is not. It is Greg Olson. Obviously, that was a stupid question in and of itself. But in front of him is still Will Disley. That is what I was looking for right there. So Jacob Hollister finds himself as the third tight end on the Seattle Seahawks with, yes, an aged Greg Olson coming in. But, you know, he's still successful. And we've also got Will Disley in front of him, who Will Disley, went on the field, was producing. And he was producing well. So Jacob Hollister finds himself as the third man in this tight end core. And it just doesn't do anything for me. But then, but then, you know, we look at this and there's just one shining gem right in the middle. And the answer, if you didn't know it, is always Adam Troutman. It's always, always, always Adam Troutman. Who's the best tight end in this draft class? Adam Troutman. Who's the best tight end of this list? Adam Troutman. Who's going to finish as a top 20 tight end his rookie season? It's Adam Troutman. I am so excited about this guy. I can't even explain it to you guys. Go watch back through the combine film. And I know that blocking has nothing to do with fantasy production. But what blocking does have something to do with is coaches respecting you and trusting you. Is Drew Brees respecting you and trusting you? All of those things come into play. And when you go watch Adam Troutman hit that blocking sled and make every single other, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, I mean every single other tight end look like a small child in comparison, you'll realize this kid is the same but different because Adam Troutman is an absolute stud out of Dayton, okay? You, you, let me look at his stat line from Dayton real quick. He comes in at six foot five, 255 pounds. He was drafted with a 3.41 pick. He ran a 4.8 40 yard dash, which is nothing crazy, but he had a 9.68 speed score, which is a little bit better, and an 11.05 agility score. That's the thing that you need to focus on the agility score. He's in the 95th percentile of agility scores. He is lightning quick, twitchy quick. And in his last year at Dayton, he had 70 receptions for 916 receiving yards and 14 touchdowns, okay? I am telling you that Jared Cook is not going to be able to hold this kid off for long. An old-ass busted Jared Cook is not going to be able to hold this kid off for long. And I am just so excited about him. Go look at the history of the Saints' production with the tight ends. I mean, they have a storied history of having productive tight ends. Jared Cook, I think, has had two top 10 uh, producing seasons with them, okay? And I, and I don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure if that's right. Stop trying to pin me into a corner. But I think he has. And I think Adam Troutman is going to be the heir apparent of that tight end lineage, okay? So when we're looking at these three guys right here, we've got Jacob Hollister at ADP 334, sitting at third on his depth chart. We've got Jeremy Sprinkles with ADP 336, having to fight off the Young Bucks of AGG, Steve Sims, F1, Antonio Gibson. But then we have Adam Troutman, who, yes, he does have some of the craziest competition in New Orleans. But what he also has is a dedicated target share towards the tight end position, an absolute bonker skill set with an agility score that's off the charts, and he's a guy that I think is just going to produce. So at ADP 343, even below those two, He's the same, but different. So let's move on to the la the next and final grouping of everybody here, okay? We're going on to our last group of tight ends. We're going to look at Austin Hooper first, ADP 93, okay? Moving on to the Browns. We've got Jared Cook at ADP 90, okay? The direct line competition for the guy that I said was going to finish tight end 20 in Adam Troutman. And then we've got Jonu Smith bringing up the rear at ADP 97, Okay. So let's start off with Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper moves on to the Browns. And I am not convinced that Austin Hooper is that great of a tight end. I'm not saying he's a bad tight end. I'm not even saying that he's not a good tight end. He's a good tight end. But the thing that really spells it out well for me is that Austin Hooper's had productive years at tight end. He's done very, very well in Atlanta. He excelled. But somehow, when we're looking at this, the FFP ADP, FFPC ADP has him down at ADP 90. But it has Hayden Hurst, who hasn't done a one-fifth the production that Austin Hooper has, at ADP 71. So what does that tell us, guys? That tells us that the general consensus is that Austin Hooper wasn't the thing that made Austin Hooper happen in Atlanta. It was Atlanta. 
It was Matt Ryan. It was a guy by the name of Julio Jones pulling coverage. It was the offensive scheme. It was everything tied into one that made Austin Hooper Austin Hooper. And now he finds himself in the Browns, a place where an uber-talented David Njoku was not able to find his feet and succeed, okay? And he still has that guy there as competition, and he has to work his way through it. But let's look at what Austin Hooper did last year. Obviously, it's not going to be the same, but he's 6'4", 254 pounds. He ran a 4.72, uh, 40. You know, he's a, he, he had a good showing in the combine in his rookie season. He had 75 receptions last year for 787 receiving yards and six touchdowns. He had a great season, okay? But this isn't the same season. It's not the same team. It's not the same quarterback. It's nothing the same. So we're going to look on to the next one. All right, now that we know a little bit about Austin Hooper right there, Look at Jared Cook. Like I said, you know, Jared Cook has had a really good time in New Orleans. He's done well. The offense loves tight ends in New Orleans. They produce there. Six foot five, 248 pounds. But another thing that we need to look at when we're looking at Jared Cook is that he is old, crusty, busty at 33.4 years old, okay? But dude's an athlete. You can't take nothing away from him on that stance. He has a 4.5% or 4.540 yard dash. A 121 speed score, a 133 burst score, you know, but he's down at 11.81 in agility, which is wild. But all the, but the, the, the 40, the speed score, and the burst score are all in the 97, 98 percentile. The dude is a freak athlete. Last season, he had 43 receptions for 705 receiving yards and nine touchdowns. Okay, nine touchdowns. That is second amongst tight ends. And I'm, I'm telling you, Jared Cook has competition that he's never even seen with Adam Troutman obviously it's going to take Troutman a little time to get his bearings but I think that Troutman is going to be a lot more competition than people are giving him credit for and those nine touchdowns might have to be split up a little bit so then we look down the list to Jonu Smith at ADP 97 okay Jonu Smith is now the heir apparent to all Delaney Walker's targets from last season and the new offensive coordinator the new offensive coordinator as of last year and the new play caller as of 2020, now that Mike Vrabel is taking over the defensive play calling, the new offensive play caller is the former tight end coach for the Tennessee Titans. Who does a tight end coach like? He likes his tight ends. He's worked with them really well. He trusts them. He'll build plays for them. So Johnny Smith finds himself in an advantageous situation. But even with the departure of Delaney Walker last season after he got injured, He wasn't able to really put it all together. At the end of the year, he had 35 receptions for 439 receiving yards and three touchdowns. But, you know, I think that there is going to be a lot that they can carve out. There was something like just under 100 vacated targets. It might be more, it might be less, but there's a lot of available targets in Tennessee, okay? It's a lot of available targets. And when you have a player like A.J. Brown, who's so productive, it pulls coverages. And when you have a player like Jonu Smith, when the ball is in his hands being hyper-productive in yards after catch, they find ways to produce, okay? I'm not saying that Jonu Smith is going to be an absolute tried-and-true baller. I'm not even saying that he's going to be a top-10 tight end. But I am saying that amongst these guys, I think he handedly has that in his range of outcomes where I'm not convinced with these other fellas, all right? Johnu Smith at ADP 97, I think has the ability to be a top 10 tight end. I think that with his yards after catch, you know, with his truck stick ability, I don't know if you've seen the pictures of that dude in the freaking gym, but he looks like an alien because he's the same as these guys, but he's different. All right. At an ADP 97, it's the same ADP as these guys, but his ceiling is different. Everything about him is the same, but different. All right. And it doesn't help that one of my favorite quarterbacks in the league, one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the league, and Ryan Tannehill is chucking him the rock. That doesn't hurt either. All right. So let's go over our tight end list one more time. We've got the first grouping of Jacob Hollister at ADP 334, Adam Troutman at ADP 343, Jeremy Sprinkles at ADP 336, and the different one among the bunch is my boy Adam Troutman, because if you didn't know, now you know the answer is always 
always, always Adam Troutman. Then we go on to our next grouping where we've got Austin Hooper, Jared Cook, and Jonu Smith. Austin Hooper at ADP 93, Jared Cook at ADP 90, and Jonu Smith bringing up the rear at ADP 97. Jonu Smith is the different one there in physicality and accuracy of the quarterback. Not really because Breeze is a more accurate quarterback, but in yards after a catch. In every way that you can think of, I believe that Johnny Smith has the edge on these guys, and that's why at ADP 97, he's built different. So, guys, these are our similar but different groupings of players. If you find yourself staring down the barrel of one of these debates in your draft, remember this video that we talked about. Remember what Triple DFFP told you, you know, and I hope you like my takes on it. If you don't, fuck it, because I'm drunk.